Welcome to this conversation about cultures of expertise, uh, politics of social science, and the role of behavioral science in policy. So this conversation is hosted by the project Expertise Under Pressure, which is housed at the Center for Humanities and Social Change, which is made possible by the New Institute in Hamburg, Germany. Um, the hosts are Anna Alexandrova and Mike Kenny. We are colleagues on this project. Uh, I am a reader in philosophy of science at University of Cambridge, and Mike Kenny is a professor of public policy and the co-director of the Bennett Institute for Public Policy. And it is our great pleasure to uh, host Professor Eric Angner of University of Stockholm with us. Pleasure so, to be here, Anna and Mike. Thank you for tuning in, Eric. So there is a very good reason why we asked you to talk to us about these matters. You are both uh, a philosopher and an economist with two PhDs from University of Pittsburgh. And you're also uh, an author of one of the very first textbooks on behavioral economics, a course in behavioral economics, now translated into uh, many languages and into its third edition. We will uh, get to behavioral uh, science and behavioral economics shortly, but let us start uh, with um, your vision of the different cultures of expertise that have may be made particularly visible in the current crisis. The current corona situation, I think, is particularly interesting in this regard because you're seeing all these groups who have uh, legitimate, relevant expertise trying to make themselves relevant. And they are relevant, of course, but in various ways. And to some extent, they're competing because they're offering competing visions and they're competing for space on television and so on. You have the epidemiologists who have certain tools and certain habits and certain ways of thinking. Then you have the economists who bring a certain dif a different level of, or different kind of sensibility to this, different kinds of models and theories and so on. And then you have psychologists and other medical professionals who have their own uh, presuppositions and ideas. And of course, all of these groups have legitimate claims to our attention, but they also bring to bear various kinds of prejudices and preconceptions onto the topic that might be interesting to pay attention to as we're trying to adjudicate competing claims and so on between these different communities. So, and in particular, um, you think we're seeing a contrast between, uh, um, diff between roles of experts in different um, countries? I think that's right. Um, the question about different countries is interesting too, because if you look at what's going on in public discourse across the world, you see very different sort of ways of interacting with each other. So I'm based in Stockholm, Sweden, and so I'm observing what's going on here. And Sweden has a very strong epistocratic element to its, uh, its system of governance, meaning that experts call the shots to a great extent. Sweden is organized in such a way that many of the day-to-day -day decisions are made by independent, extremely powerful public agencies, and they're run relatively independently. Ministers are barred by law from interfering with their day-to-day -day operations. They get a, a regulatory letter every so often with the principles they're supposed to be following, following, but other than that, they're operating independently, which means that the head of the public health agency here has to a very great extent to become the face of the government during the crisis. And he's also at the receiving end of most of the criticism that, you, that you've probably seen. Elsewhere, things are extremely different. And I think maybe the US is the most obvious example where politicians remain in, in charge, really want to remain in charge by the looks of it, and where the president's son-in-law appears uh, contradicting and overruling various health professionals. So you see this tension between different communities, politicians and experts and so on, very clearly on display right now. And it raises a whole range of interesting questions that uh, some of which, of course, we'll be disc discussing over the next uh, hour or so. Uh, Mike, why don't you step in to describe uh, the UK case as you see it uh, in these terms? Yeah, I, I think it's, um, it's really interesting to think about uh, the UK in, in that kind of wider comparative frame. I mean, just before I do that, I mean, a first quick observation um, 
uh, Eric in response to that point. I think I think you're absolutely right. It's really interesting to see the the very different um, sort of cultures of expertise in in relation to different to wider political cultures the, the different countries. I mean, one thing I'd, I'd observe as well is that that clearly history matters here a lot, and in those countries that have had an experience of of a pandemic. Um, it's interesting to see that, you know, particularly countries like South Korea, uh, Singapore, even China, I think, um, you tend to see a system that is, that is particularly receptive to, um, to expertise in relation to epidemiology and to, you know, to, to areas of knowledge that, that pertain to that epidemic. So I, I think there's something very interesting there about the different country responses um, and the degree to which history is also uh, shaping the, those the relationship between expertise and, and governmental decision making in the UK. Um, I guess we're we're sort of somewhere between. If you think of Sweden at one end and the US at the other in relation to these issues, we're falling somewhere uncomfortably in the middle. And I think, I mean, one of the issues that's arisen here is 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 well, there are two questions following what you've said that I think are interesting to think about. One is which experts are being listened to, and it, this has been framed in the media as a bit of a, a battle between epidemiologists and behavioral scientists. Now, actually, the reality is more complicated than that, but it does look as if um, the politicians have at different times been been primed to hear the messages of those different experts and they've been primed often really for political reasons it's it's when it looks in the uk as if when the government began to worry about public opinion and the fact that people increasingly seem to be becoming more and more worried about the virus and the fact that the government hadn't locked down hadn't moved in the way that other countries had that it began to listen to the epidemiological community and particularly this this famous this iconic paper from imperial i mean that was actually only one data source so it'd be interesting to get your thoughts on that uh, question you know why it is that decision makers are more primed to listen to one community than the other but i, I think the other thing that that in the uk case it really acutely shows is that there is a politics in all of this and at times the decision makers have actually wanted to say look the experts are telling us to do this they're telling us they were telling us not to lock down so heavily early on and then they started to tell us no let's lock down so we followed them in other words the blame or responsibility for certain actions might be then pushed back onto the experts and there's a lot of discourse in the uk about whether there are political reasons for that, or maybe it's 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 ministers who are worried about the future public inquiry. So I guess two issues to just put put in front of you there: one about the, the the which groups of experts get listened to and why, and the second about the politics of responsibility. Just your thoughts on those would be interesting. Yeah, this is terrific, Mike. Um, so there's a saying about how generals always prepare to fight the last battle, right? And normally that's meant to indicate that the generals are, are misguided, that they're not planning for the battle of the future. But there's also a sense in which this makes this makes sense, right? This is reasonable. And as, as you point out, there are some Asian countries, um, above all, who have recent experiences of, of pandemics and who might have been better prepared for this sort of situation. Sweden does not have a, a, a recent history of pandemic. I mean, it's been literally 100 years since the last big one. And as a result of this, the Swedish government does not have the authority to declare, for example, a state of emergency uh, as a result of a pandemic. It could do so in a state of war, uh, but it couldn't do so in, in, uh, in a state of a pandemic. And that's flavored the Swedish response in a very great, uh, to a very great extent. So the government in Sweden has to operate by means of gentle advice or recommendations, as they call it, rather than binding law. And it also flavors, I think, the way in which different experts are, are taken seriously or, or listened to. And it flavors perhaps also the level of preparedness that you see among different kinds of, of experts. There's one thing that I seem to have noticed here and elsewhere is that some people really rise to the occasion. They seem to be ready to communicate with the public. They seem to know how to reach out to public to the policymakers and so on. And then there are others who are frankly making fools of themselves uh, uh, 
yeah, messing things up very badly in the process. And you think of this in the context of other disciplines of medicine, for example, if you're a surgeon, you have repeated experience, hopefully, with surgery. And so you're ready and you're emotionally prepared and you know what you need to do and you've got the playbook down. Whereas if you're an epidemiologist and you haven't dealt with this on your home turf uh, uh, ever over the course of your career, your lifetime, you may not be as prepared as you should have been. I think that's a really interesting point, actually, about the the the, the degree to which, in in an, in an extraordinary situation, you know, people, uh, those experts who who are really uh, on the front line, as it were, of you know, suddenly interacting with officials and with with um, political decision makers in a way that that you know, it's absolutely um, there's no training course for this. You know, the pressure that falls on people and the sense of public exposure as well, I think that goes with this is, is one of the really um, striking features of, I think, of, of, of this story everywhere. Can I just come back to you, Eric, on, on the Swedish case? I'm really interested in, in the question of how contestation works within the communities of expertise that, that are sort of interested or that, that are commenting on this. Because I've seen some, there's a report, I think there was a letter, wasn't there, of a number of experts who, who were, who you know, didn't like the the direction of travel that the the government has gone in, and who who were essentially making the case, I think, for a tougher lockdown, based upon a different reading of of the data. And some of them, I think, were from different academic backgrounds. I mean, do you have a feel for this? About is this a kind of turf war between different kinds of experts, or is it just a, a, a legitimate disagreement about what inferences to draw from the data? These are great questions. I should say right away that I have no inside information about this. All the everything I can say is what I've read about in the press. But there's some there's definitely some legitimate questions here. So the shots are called by a group of, of experts is with the public health agency. They're epidemiologists, they have domain relevant expertise. It's not one person calling the shots, it's a committee decision. They seem to be very much in agreement about this. There have been no signs of internal disagreement within the public health agency. They also say that they're broadly in agreement with public health agencies elsewhere in the Scandinavian countries, with the Nordic countries, which is interesting as well. The pushback has come from, I guess, a, a couple of different groups. The most vocal group has been a series of medical researchers, some of whom are epidemiologists, some of whom are not, who feel very strongly that um, the government should have taken a harder line, pushed for, for harsher lockdowns and, and so on. Some of that reflects different visions of how you do science and what constitutes evidence, I think. So the public health agency published a playbook late last year where they talk about the evidence uh, for a pandemic. They actually were prepared to, to, to some extent. And what they say is that there's very little evidence whatsoever when it comes to non-medical interventions, which of course are the only interventions that are gonna be available early on in a pandemic. They point to randomized control trials of face masks, they point to a small number of randomized control trials about hand washing, and they say this is basically all the solid evidence that we have. And I think this flavors their decision to some extent. They're looking at the literature, they find no solid evidence. They say that school closings, for example, would make much of a difference. And they've selected then these sort of softer approaches, which critics call lax. The critics, especially the ones who are epidemiologists, operate with a very different sort of conception of science, I think, where they build these enormously complex models where they model every individual in the whole country and how they move about and how they try to come up with projections then of what's going to happen next. Completely unpredictably, the predictions that they come up with are extremely different. And so they differ on the order of two orders of magnitude, where um, just a few weeks ago, the public health agency suggested that the fatalities might have peaked, which would suggest that Sweden was looking at an additional 2,000 deaths, for example. A group of epidemiologists who are active here at the medical university, not far from where I am, built a model that they're, they're publishing where they're predicting 96,000 deaths before the month of July. And that's a full percent of the population. So extremely different, different predictions, but they reflect different conceptions of what constitutes evidence. 
the emphasis on randomized controlled trials in the one case and the emphasis on mathematical models in the other. Of course, if you have any experience with economics or philosophy of economics, you know that there's this large debate about the value of models and the conditions under which models are likely to, to work well. And um, there's much to say about that. So one of the things that comes out of that literature is that models are particularly useful when you're dealing with a stable data generating process where the same thing happens over and over again. And where moreover, you've had a chance to calibrate the model. You know what values various parameters should take. And what we have here in the case of a novel virus in a new situation where they haven't had these pandemics in 100 years, Obviously, these models are going to be very hard to calibrate. This is not a criticism of the people developing them. It's just to say that we should be extremely cautious when we interpret these sorts of, of results. But I think this is where, this is where the, um, at least much of the conflict is coming from. So another contrast, uh, uh, Mike, if I may come in here, seems to be about um, who gets included into um, the um, teams of experts. So Eric, uh, you've mentioned that the public health agency in uh, um, Sweden is mostly epidemiologists. We've been, uh, uh, we've had a lot of interesting articles recently in the UK uh, about uh, um, how narrow is the range of experts in uh, um, the SAGE, the committee that advises UK government, but that already seems wider than, uh, than just epidemiologists, right? At least there are some molecular biologists, there are, uh, and, and there are some others there. Um, and so even that get, gets criticized. So Tony Costello wrote yesterday about how, you know, uh, nursing experts are not, uh, or clinical experts are not involved, social scientists are not involved, logistics experts are not involved. So um, do, do you see a contrast there? I mean, so, so is uh, epidemiology really the queen science at the moment mm -hmm. in Sweden, and how does that differ from elsewhere? Well, so this is a case where the constitutional framework matters greatly. So in Sweden, the organization, the day-to-day -day operations of the government are run to a very great extent by these independent agencies, but they're divided up by domain in a sort of uh, cake-like fashion, where the public health agency is supposed to keep an eye not just on COVID-related deaths, but on public health broadly construed. So that includes domestic violence and mental health um, of people under lockdown and so on. They're making a holistic judgment to that extent, but it's not, it's no part of their job to look at economic consequences, for example, or to weigh public health concerns against economic concerns. That's quite properly the role of, of politicians. And I think a legitimate kind of critique that you could be leveraging against this mode of organization and the work that we've seen here is that the various agencies are operating in a relatively insular way. There's no reason they shouldn't have advisory boards of scientists from other domains and members of the public, for, for example. There's no reason they should not be publicizing their work more, uh, more obviously. And so now we have hundreds of thousands of amateur epidemiologists, right, putting a lot of effort into like, trying to figure out what's going on. And you could leverage that. So we should be doing open science here. We should be publishing all the data right away. We should be publishing all the work. Uh, we should be showing how we came to conclusions so that people feel included in this, this process. It has to do with the legitimacy of the recommendations that come out of this. So to a very great extent, I feel people here think the results are legitimate. Like trust in experts, trust in politicians is through the roof. It's increased by 20 percentage point in, in just a month. But nonetheless, the fact that the public does not have a good sense for how people are thinking and where their predictions are coming from, I think feeds a certain level of distrust nonetheless and a certain feeling that these recommendations might not be completely legitimate. And if you're worried about compliance, which of course everyone is worried about, then questions about legitim legitimacy, I think should be right front and center. It's really interesting to, to I think that point about the, the, the link between the, the institutionalized processes whereby expert knowledge is, is presented and informs um, sort of 
decision making and legitimacy, I, I think is really interesting. And it is, um, it's a question certainly here in the UK where the, the, the main institutional forum, the, the, the SAGE group, has come un, under quite a lot of questioning about who's a member and why are they met, why then why, why do we not know who's a member because they keep the membership secret and then even a, a, a recent question about uh, a controversial political advisor attending those meetings and that raises interesting questions about you know when and how should political worldviews be brought into dialogue with with the expertise but just before we get on to that I, I just some, something that I don't get a strong sense of in the Swedish case Eric and but that has been very much to the fore in the UK and I think in the US as well is a sort of tension between or um, uh, people talking about the economy and people with a certain kinds of expertise about uh, what's happening to the economy in the context of, of a lockdown um, and how we try to calculate the future costs of, de of, of basically shutting our economies down now. That, that kind of expert knowledge is not institutionalized in these processes. It's not really included in the British um, sort of um, sage res uh, response and it's not included in the US public health um, expert body. Um, and yet people arguing that actually we shouldn't be looking down so heavily now, or at least we should be more conscious of the future human costs of the economic damage we're doing. They've been quite frustrated and not being able to be quite so included in some of these deliberations. I just wonder in the, in the Swedish context, is, has that not, I don't sense that fault line. And is that because actually those people feel, well, actually their views have to a degree been respected because the lockdown hasn't been quite so draconian? Or is it because there isn't a fault line along that, uh, on that basis? I think on the whole, from my perspective, I'm seeing a great deal of agreement between economists and epidemiologists. Now you might, you might expect offhand that economists would be all about reopening the economy and getting the wheels to turn again, whereas the epidemiologists would be all about like, minimizing COVID-related death. But that sort of fault line is really not the sort of thing that you've been seeing. Um, in uh, the US, you see this tension more clearly, but the tension is between the business community who really want their meatpacking plants up and running again, and the epidemiologists and the public health authorities who, who want to minimize the spread of the disease. You're not seeing that sort of conflict between economists and epidemiologists. In the Swedish case, the public health agency, as I said, has no business thinking about economic uh, consequences. That would probably be the role of, of the politicians and the, the central government. They have not been talking very much about this. So it's unclear to what extent economic concerns are there in their minds. Presumably they're keeping an eye on this and they're probably relieved that the public health authority is not pushing for, for harsher uh, uh, restrictions, but I don't, I don't know about that. A contrast that's interesting is that between Sweden and Denmark, because they have similar organizations in various ways, but Denmark has less of an episocratic element than Sweden does. And in Denmark, the politicians went out at some point, started closing borders and things against the advice of the public health authority. Um, if they had economic advisors pushing for this, I don't know, but I assume that was not the case. And do you think on, on the legitimacy question, um, following that, I mean, how, at the moment, it sounds like trust, levels of public trust in, in the, um, in scientists and also in the decision makers is in government is very high. I mean, what what might change that? Do you think? I mean, particularly thinking because this is so obviously a comparative crisis. You know, people are looking very carefully at other countries, particularly neighbouring countries. So I guess the, the Denmark model is is the kind of natural comparator for for Sweden and vice versa. Do you think that legitimacy could decline? if the outcomes of the policies look over time as if they're, they're, that they are significantly worse. In the it, it could absolutely erode. And so what you've seen in the Nordic countries are very different death rates. So Sweden has death rates that are way higher than its neighbors. Now, what does this mean? Well, it's unclear at this stage. So the worry about overly harsh restrictions overly soon is that they merely push the outbreak forward in time. 
So what, what might happen next in Finland, for example? Well, if it turns out that they release their restrictions or they lift their restrictions and they're seeing the sort of bump that Sweden has had, well, that will clearly validate the Swedish approach. Whereas if they can remove their restrictions and then keep things under control, that would validate their initial uh, uh, strategy. So far, the general public, as I said, have been strongly in support of the Swedish approach. But um, there are clearly voices of dissent. And uh, you know, right now, the death numbers do not look good for the Swedish arrangement. I think it's too early to say which, which worked. But I think absolutely, if things continue like this, this will definitely erode trust in, in experts and in the public agencies quite generally. And that might have a vast effect on the way Sweden is run. There's also politically, as you know, far right wing um, that's been rising over the course of the last decades or so. They tend to be less interested in ordinary day to day politics, reasonable conversation and so on. They tend to be more firebrands. And if it turns out that the established the establishment's approach is a failure, that would definitely give them air under their wings. Thank you, which brings us nicely, I think, to um, the question of values in scientific advice. So um, one of the, um, you know, one, one of the refrains we keep hearing from the British government is that the advice is science led. Uh, they very quickly have been uh, picked up um, by various commentators, including from our discipline, Eric, uh, History and Philosophy of Science, pointing out that uh, you know, action, policy or otherwise is never purely science-led and uh, um, science itself is uh, value-laden and of course decisions about uh, which science to follow and how also uh, requires value judgments. So my first question, given that Sweden is perhaps as close to epistocracy as we come, is what are the values of uh, the scientists in Sweden who are making the advice? Is that, uh, are they at all worried about it? Are they at all explicit about it? Is, um, you know, as a, as a philosopher of science, uh, I'm sure you will, uh, uh, your, your ear pick, perks up when uh, uh, scientists make claims that kind of mix a factual and evaluative uh, judgments. And so what have you seen so far? Oh, yes. I mean, there's a very strong rhetoric surrounding science and evidence and so on that downplays the role of the values in the process. And so I su su suppose people feel the urge to use this sort of rhetoric because they want to put more weight on science and more weight on evidence. But nonetheless, it's true that values enter this process uh, at every stage along the way. And the values are often, often suppressed. So in the Swedish case, the values are supposed to come from the central government. They're supposed to come from elected politicians. They're supposed to be handed over to the technocrats um, in the public health agencies. But as everyone can tell, right, those values will always be implicit to a very great extent or be poorly thought out. There's some language that comes back. There's a language of welfare, for example, which from philosophical perspective, we know that there's a lot of different ways to interpret this. There's enormous amount of latitude here. And uh, how people interpret these things is not always, is not always clear. Um, this is interesting from a philosophical point of view, of course, because you have an urge to step in and say, well, you know, actually, you say evidence, but the evidence is combined with values of these kinds and so on. People might resent you for causing trouble in that way. But I also think it's absolutely critical that we make these values explicit to the extent that, that we can. And people need to know what sort of values are being promoted by their elected politicians. We need to know what sort of values are being promoted by the recommendations that we're asked to follow, for example. Um, and so it's well worth talking more about this. Thank you. Do you, I sometimes think that this advice that we often give, you know, make your values explicit, is a council of perfection, really. Um, it, you know, it takes um, a great deal of, uh, you know, intelligent uh, and informed analysis of 
uh, say a historical, uh, you know, historical episode in the science to pick out what the values were, right? So it's not like you know Hobbes and Boyle were aware of the values that you know Shapen and Schaffer later on attributed to them, right? So so to say to Hobbes and Boyle, you know, could you please make your values explicit in your debate about the vacuum? Is a bit of an impossible advice, and uh, we we keep giving it. I can't myself get away from. <laughs> to be honest. I guess we're flattering ourselves because making assumptions explicit is what we do as philosophers. It's what we like to do and it's what we do well. Now we're telling everyone that they ought to be doing that. <laughs> so that's a, a point well taken. That said, I mean, we could talk about various ways in which we can not only make the values explicit, but make the values reflect the values of the population to a greater extent, for example. And so um, citizen-led initiatives, advisory groups, and so on, you can provide the values to the experts making technocratic decisions would be a step up, I think. You see those sorts of arrangements in places, but it's something that ought to be implemented, I think, in a, in a much more systematic way. That, that said, I mean, you and I and many of our colleagues like to talk about public input into the scientific process and so on. And then every so often scientists try to reach out and search for input, um, for example, on, on Twitter. And what they're getting back is like mainly abuse and curse words and things. And so I'll say that like reaching out to the public and eliciting values, is, you know, engaging in a sort of deliberative democracy is much harder than it might sound in a philosophical seminar room. And, and obviously it's tougher in the context of an emergency to, to, um, to, 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 to be very deliberative in that way. I mean, I, I, I was thinking also, Eric, about, I guess, a different kind of value, which is integral, as we know, to the academic enterprise across these different disciplines, but is sometimes occluded or pushed off to the side when experts are required to present their knowledge in these situations, and that's uncertainty. I mean, the, the, the sense that um, actually both are, um, I mean, you, you talked a bit about modeling, uh, which is one, you know, one sort of way of, of, of trying to gather an understanding of the, of the, of the world but and and there are other techniques too but 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 you know we we, we know as academics those are always provisional in, in to a degree in character and we know that we are we are we are operating both in conditions of uncertainty and our, our understanding of processes which we are we are trying to grasp are, are themselves you know in, in many ways quite provisional quite uncertain do you do you sense that there's a problem here that 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 sense of uncertainty gets sort of left behind when it comes to the challenge of communicating results and findings. Absolutely. I think how we handle the uncertainty is, is critical. So on the one hand, I'm sure scientists feel the urge to sort of understate the degree of uncertainty, to exaggerate the extent of their uncertainty. If you're concerned about too many people dying as a result of lax recommendations, for example, you might be tempted to like, overstate the certainty of your prediction. Um, and that might be effective in the short term, but it might also serve to erode trust in yourself and your entire community. When scientists make very confident predictions, they can be checked against what actually happened, and they will often turn out to be off the mark. Um, on the other hand, there are scientists who are trying to be very explicit about their uh, the, the uncertainty of their forecasts. And so if you look at various websites like health data, uh, for example, you'll get these predictions of the number of people who will die in various countries and states. But the level of uncertainty is really staggering. So the last time I looked this up, uncertainty ranges like 95% confidence intervals might range from 150 to 15,000. And if you're honest about the uncertainty of your forecast, then there's a sense in which what you're coming up with is really uh, quite useless. And if the best you can do is to say that you're 95% certain that the number of fatalities will be between 150 and 15,000, then you really, you're not making yourself very useful, right? Uh, a consumer of these sorts of analyses could very easily say, well, look, I mean, if that's the best you can do, I'm going to go look elsewhere. Is, 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 I get the sense for you, having read one or two things you've written recently, but, but you, you also think that being, being conveying uncertainty to some degree is part of the, the, the ethos of responsibility 
which you want or humility i think you've talked about which you you think experts should should cultivate i mean can you tell us a bit more about that about how well first of all why you think that's so important and and how we might go about promoting that that virtue yeah, so I've been thinking a lot recently about how there really are some principles of responsible conduct if you're a scientist and you're communicating with people outside of your discipline. Other professions have explicit codes of conduct, right? Engineers and doctors and lawyers and so on have this. As scientists, experts, we have nothing of the sort. That doesn't mean that there, there aren't sort of ethical principles that we ought to be obeying. And some of them are, are kind of obvious. Right? We should not be lying, we should not be deceiving. Um, but related to that is we should not be overstating the extent of our certainty. We really don't know what's gonna happen next. We ought to be willing to say so. And there are many reasons for that. One is that we should not be misrepresenting the, the nature of our beliefs, the nature of our knowledge. The other is more consequentialist in that if we act excessively confident, which many people do, of course, then um, that will end up eroding trust in our, in our theories and in our forecast. And as scientists, we need to be, as experts in our domains, we need to be comfortable with the ambiguity and the uncertainty. And that degree, level of comfort ought to be reflected in the way that we communicate with the outside world. I, I guess my question back to that is, um, I, I can see that if you're thinking about experts almost as a, um, uh, you know, as, as a self-contained community, or if we're thinking about how, how academic experts ought to behave in relation to these sort of ethical goals. But when you put politicians and decision makers into the mix, and, and um, you know, we were talking before about the idea of an epistemic community, when you, you join those, these very different kinds of um, uh, users of knowledge together, isn't, isn't uncertainty and uh, just bound to go out the window because politics doesn't brook, political discourse doesn't like uncertainty it doesn't work in relation to arguments that, that say well we, if we go this direction we might find that this is going to happen I mean that's just not how politicians are going to frame their arguments to the public and it's not how they're going to argue with each other I mean do you have any thoughts on that I mean the Swedish system it sounds as if there's quite a clear firewall between you know, the, the institutional sites of, of expertise and then decision making in other contexts, particularly here in the UK, but, but other countries too, those things are much more kind of mixed together. Can we, can we have that strong sense of, of um, uh, you know, uncertainty being conveyed when we're talking to politicians? It's very clearly going to be difficult. And so one thing to be alert to is the fact that there are selection effects where politicians really don't want scientists to express too much uncertainty. You know that famous story about the one-armed economist, right? Um, and so there is some degree of, of selection where excessively confident people are drawn to centers of power where their competent judgments are appreciated. Same thing on television. If you're looking for a scientist to go on television, you don't want somebody who's too wishy-washy. Right? You want somebody who expresses very firm beliefs about stuff. And so in the case of the community of economists, which is the community that I know best from the inside, there's this enormous gap between the stuff that people do in their offices and so on, what the serious economists are up to, the sort of work that they present at academic conferences on the one hand, and the sort of economists that you see on television. There's some degree of overlap between these two communities, but to a very great extent, those are completely different groups of people, where the economists you see on television tend to be uh, hired guns, in some cases hired to come to a particular conclusion rather than hired to reason in the way that's best supported by the evidence and so on. And I'm sure you see a little of that in the case of epidemiologists as well. There's one kind of person who's going to be more likely to show up and offer advice. There's one person who will be more in, in demand. And so I guess what I'm saying is that there are supply side effects and there are demand side effects. And the outcome of this is going to be an equilibrium where excessively confident people are the ones that you see on television and the ones that you associate with a community of scholars. Uh, as a whole. And, and I guess just to follow that up in, in the political context, I, I guess the, 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 the risk of going back to the values conversation, the risk of having 
um, experts who are who are much more upfront about their values, who make very clear what their you know what their normative position is or their underlying worldview. I guess there is a risk then that 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 politicians in systems, perhaps unlike Sweden, but but in many other countries, then there'll be a real temptation to pick your experts according to their value preferences, not necessarily according to their skill in terms of epidemiological mod modeling or economic forecasting. And I, you know, you, that, that kind of pre-selection of, of experts and the, the tendency for decision makers to be drawn to certain experts rather than others. So it's not just something that happens on the media, it's something that definitely happens in, in the policy making system. Um, that, that's, that's, I think, a very ingrained temptation for decision makers. And that's, I guess, my slight pushback on the idea that we want experts to be more open about, about their values, because that might lead us to, that, to this even greater problem. Yeah, I, I hear you. There's a related problem, too, which has to do with the values that we're trying to maximize. We have a picture, especially in philosophy, also in economics and elsewhere, of individuals having values, bringing them to bear in a certain situation, trying to promote those values and so on. But in some situations, you get a sense that people are thinking in the opposite way. So they have a certain conclusion they favor. They, for whatever reason, have develop a faith in a certain kind of policy approach and they work backwards and select their values or their philosophical normative theories in order to get that conclusion. I think experts are susceptible to this to a very great extent. And the reason is simple, right? Experts are also human beings. We have the same cognitive biases as everybody else and we should expect experts to reveal them in their, in their behavior. So I think there's a lot of, we have lots of reasons not to lionize um, experts as we think about the various ways in which they can contribute productively to the conversation. Because experts of various kinds have certainly made fools of themselves in the past and they will do so again. And one group of experts to move our conversation forward that has, uh, that appears to have made themselves uh, indispensable um, in the UK, uh, sounds like also in Sweden, is uh, the behavioral scientists. Uh, so I'd like us to talk about that for a bit now. Um, as an author of a textbook on uh, behavioral science, um, I, Eric, I'm really keen to hear you reflect on, first of all, what do you think is the scope of behavioral science? How come behavioral science is a uh, um, it takes on a name that's not just kind of social science, regular social science, and how come they were able to be, well, for example, behavioral scientists, but not um, regular social scientists are on the SAGE advisory committee in, uh, in the UK. Um, it sounds like in Sweden as well. Um, do you have any explanation for why it happened? Do you have any insights on uh, how this, cat this new category of scientist arose? Uh, what is its recent history? Uh, these, are, these are great questions. I mean, we should remind ourselves that there's a lot of negotiation that goes on when it comes to identifying these boundaries and picking out what mode is an acceptable mode of doing science and so on. I suspect or I assume that at a certain level of abstraction, everyone you're talking about would agree that the behavioral sciences are, or are engaged in the systematic empirical study of human behavior individually or in groups. But then the moment you drill down just a tiny little bit, you'll see a great deal of heterogeneity among these people. So behavioral scientists differ with respect to the theoretical frameworks that they use, whether they're committed to rational choice models or something more rule-based or norm-based or something altogether different. The different behavioral scientists differ with respect to the, me the methods that they're using. Some are running randomized controlled trials of the kind that we used in medicine for a long time. Some are doing field research. Some are looking at enormously large data sets that they're getting from various databases and so on. But then um, there are also sort of more subtle differences, perhaps, between different behavioral scientists. So they endure slightly different ethical constraints. So economists, experimental economists, for example, are not willing to lie to their subjects, whereas psychologists, at least sometimes, are. 
And this means that the sort of thing that they study, the sort of studies they can implement, are going to be quite different from the one area to, to the other. So there are sort of subtle differences of ethics and culture underlying this that may not be immediately obvious to, to a bystander. And then, of course, there's fashion in this, right? So in the 1970s, I guess, sociology was really popular. Why was that? I don't know. There was an ethos at the time. There was some sort of um, zeitgeist that made these sorts of broad scale social phenomena appealing to people. Recently, we've had a sort of rise in economics. Some people talk about economism to refer to the accepted faith we have in economists as behavioral scientists. In, within economics in the last 10 or so years, there's been a real um, shift, uh, perhaps a revolution, away from, at least to some extent, to the formal modeling and sophisticated mathematics and towards the empirical studies. And so these strict boundaries are constantly change, changing. They're being negotiated. They're contested, as Mike said earlier. And it's very interesting to keep track of this. In the UK case, of course, the behavioral scientists, the nudge unit, and so on, have become uh, uh, very fashionable and to some extent very powerful, more so, I think, than in any, any other country. And this has also generated some degree of pushback, from what I understand, from the public, who resent the role played by these experts, the way in which they ended up in power, and uh, the way in which regular folk end up on the receiving end of these nudges that they may or may not understand. Yeah, just to follow up on on that last point, I think it's um, I mean it's a very interesting <clears throat> question. Excuse me about about the I think the relationship between um, nudge as a model and as an approach and the behavioural science um, communities that you're discussing. I mean, the, there's a sense in which that that heterogeneity of um, approach um, and of uh, academic background it is is not that apparent when people think about nudge. I think nudge has become, has almost kind of come to stand in for uh, behavioral science in some ways, um, which is not entirely helpful. I mean, I, I guess, I mean, my, my question back to you, Eric, is whether, so one of the, you know, as you say, nudge is, is somewhat controversial here. I mean, partly actually because of um, it's it's apparent you know, the influence of, of some of its proponents in the early parts of the uh, governmental response to the pandemic here, and it became sort of associated with a with a herd immunity uh, approach, which which the government then quickly dropped. But, so there's a contingent issue here, but I think there's a there's a perhaps a more fundamental one about what nudge, what kind of understanding it it takes for granted about the state. What kind of policymaker does it presume and what kind of citizen does it assume and perhaps this is slightly a caricature but there's a the critics say look it's just assuming that agency lies with the policymakers they have knowledge they have agency they have a, a, a predetermined sense of where they want to go of what the, the ends are and the citizens are there to be kind of pushed around or tricked or, or, or manipulated towards that goal now clearly you know behavioral science or the, the science, the, the, the disciplines within it have a very rich and diverse set of understandings of, of states and their relationship to citizens and so on. So, so I guess my question is, is it a problem that nudge has become so salient in relation to the behavioral sciences? And also how should the behavioral sciences kind of deal with that challenge? I mean, should they be more explicit about developing alternative ideas about states and citizens and their relations? Yes, th those, are, those are great questions. So here's sort of one thing or two things maybe to notice that the nudge agenda grew out of the descriptive enterprise of behavioral economics, which in turn grew out of the orthodox economics. There's a sense in which there's a continuous line of, of uh, uh, inheritance here. And so the nudge agenda inherits, in fact, many of the aspects of orthodox economics in spite of the reality of it being different in certain ways and in spite of the rhetoric changing dramatically there are certain components that's still there one has to do with the methodological individualism so the focus on the individual as the ultimate building block of society and the ultimate you know, analytical piece of the puzzle the, um, the ultimate sort of lego part if if you wish so behavioral economics has more focus on cognition and affect 
than orthodox economics. But the focus is still very often on the individual first, and then you build your way up to social structures down the road. Is this good or bad? Well, it's sometimes better, sometimes worse. But this means that um, you're shifting away, the focus is shifting away from broad scale social structures of the kinds that sociologists and other kinds of behavioral scientists would, would study. And then there's the, the way in which behavioral scientists often bring to bear some sort of normative framework on the, the, the object of study. So social scientists, by and large, don't just want to understand the world, right? They want to change it, like, like Marx said. And they have different ways of assessing what's a positive change and, and a negative change and what conditions have made society a better place. So behavioral economists, to a great extent, and although there are exceptions, endorse the orthodox conception of of welfare, which has to do with the satisfaction of ultimate preferences, so the satisfaction of um, idealized or informed preferences or something. Different kinds of behavioral scientists have a different perspective on this. And so a sociologist, for example, might be interested in pro-social behavior and trying to promote pro-social behavior, understanding it with an interest, in, with, an in, with a view to like, getting more of it. And those are going to turn into very different projects. If you're ultimately interested in promoting a certain kind of value, that might affect the way you go about working your way back. That might affect the, the variables you enter into your model, the places you go to gather data, and so on. And so uh, not just your policy advice will be influenced by this, but the way in which you do science from the get-go is going to reflect the values that you're ultimately trying to promote. And this is something, I mean, it, gets, it goes back to this question we were talking about earlier of making these values explicit. Um, and of course, there are problems with that. But uh, part of why the nudge units have turned out to be controversial, I think, is that um, they're uh, sort of parochial in a way. Um, they come with a certain kind of baggage. Um, sometimes that baggage is useful. It contains tools that can be used for stuff but um, it's not as ecumenical as you might think from the way they talk about their work. Yeah, and I, I guess um, th there's a kind of a, a link as well, a different way of thinking about the, 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 the difficulty that nudge or salience puts behavioral science in is, is if you think about what's happening in, in the world of politics more widely, that, that, that certain kinds of technocratic models of government have come under increasing pressure in the last five, ten years, uh, right across uh, different kinds of, of, of democratic system. And, and nudge can be framed, I mean, it does look in, in certain instances as if it is a very technocratically orientated project, whereas I take your point that behavioral science actually is operating with some, often with very different models of and, and has a different um, has a degree of curiosity about citizens and, and might want to reach out to understand citizen motivations or to engage citizen preferences in a way that is not so obviously the true of technocratic models. And I think, I wonder if, you know, one of the risks is that if nudge is sort of, you know, comes back into fashion, as it were, in the context of dealing with a, something like a pandemic and so on, that we risk you know, kind of unlearning some of the very painful lessons we've had to learn about the the resistance to technocratic forms of decision making, about people's resentment of them, and about the limitations actually of those kinds of decisions. So, is is there is there a risk you think of a of, a, of an unduly technocratic approach? Absolutely, and to some extent, I mean, even the the behavioral economists, I think, would agree with this. So, some of the earliest proponents of what they call libertarian paternalism at the time and what led to the Nudge agenda have more recently been like pulling the brakes in a certain way. And so they've argued quite publicly that the Nudge agenda has not been oversold, but it's been overbought. So what they're saying now is that nudging was supposed to be like one tool in a toolbox. It was not supposed to supersede like all other forms of economic uh, 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 policy. It was not supposed to solve like all the big problems of the world. It was supposed to be something you could use on the margin to make some things better. And uh, w one thing that's happened is that nudging has become so popular and so fashionable. And you see the language all over the place now. And that might be missing the fact that nudging was never supposed to 
to cure cancer or you know fix global warming or eliminate poverty or something um, and so you know the technocratic element has taken off and now has a sort of life of its own in a way that not even the earliest proponents were were particularly interested in let me plug in another worry um i think a lot about um um, you know, the meaning of social science. And I watch with worry the fact that uh, behavioral scientists often stand in for social scientists. And even um, when behavioral scientists say they have a more realistic model of uh, uh, agency and decision making and choice than rational choice uh, theory, um, it is still the case that thereafter a universal context context free model of cognition you know a, a set of um, biases a set of uh, heuristics and with sort of coming together they produce all sorts of behavior where is culture in this where is uh, history in this where is place in all of this and in particular where are the qualitative uh, methods such as ethnography and participant observations that um, social scientists are so good at leveraging in order to bring out the you know extraordinary complexity um, and variability of, um, of you know of human thinking and behavior it is uh, i i think that would be i don't know whether behavioral scientists um have a sufficiently wide conception of their methods to allow for that as well and i think that's probably um you know it goes it goes together with um, the worry that mike um expressed of technocracy oh yeah these are real sources of concern and you're reminding you're reminding me that there's this gap between the rhetoric and the reality when it comes to certain kinds of behavioral economics and nudge efforts. So the rhetoric says that we study people the way they really are, we're taking into account their full complexity and so on. But then you look at the actual model in the paper and it's the same model with one more variable added. And this is not scientifically illegitimate, right? This is how science develops very often. It's cumulative. You start with something, you tinker with it, you improve it a little bit of the margin and over time the models get better and better. But if you tell yourself that this model you come up with captures the full complexity of human beings and you know all of its splendor and so on, you're clearly deluding yourself. And the things that you listed there, Anna, like all the different things that have to do with culture and context and norms and so on, they often get left out completely out of that picture. And in a political context, of course, this matters a lot because you have experts who arrive who say, well, finally, we have this model that captures all this complexity when that's not true. Right? That's very obviously overselling um, their abilities, and it's going to lead to the sort of blowback, I think, that we discussed earlier. Uh, thank you. I think we've been talking for about an hour, and maybe now is time for some uh, closing remarks and some uh, last points that we wanted to mention but didn't get to. Oh, let me just say that the project you two are involved in has um, never been more important and relevant than it is now. I'm so glad you two are on the project and I'll be uh, tracking your work very carefully. That's very kind of you, Eric. I mean, you've, you've given us a lot of food for thought and I mean, it, it is, um, it, it's an extraordinary time to live in <laughs> for all sorts of reasons, but I mean, to be slightly parochial about it, the fact that we're doing this project, which has been, you know, raising these questions about experts and expertise and their links to decision making suddenly to do that in this moment is 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 quite a uh, it's quite an extraordinary uh, thing um I, I think one or two things i take out of the conversation that are really useful for us to reflect on one is the importance of thinking comparatively i think you know your your reflections on sweden and the the, the different ways in which expert knowledge is institutionalized there compared to say the us or the uk i think that's so important actually because it's very easy to offer uh, kind of you know universalist recommendations and, and and analyses in this in this um area and i think we need to ground those much more in thinking about different countries and from my perspective as a political scientist to think about politics but i also think the um you know those reflections on behavioral sciences on that heterogeneity and on the 
um, on, on the sense of, of, of the dynamic quality, actually, of behavioral science, that it's, it's, it's undergoing an, uh, you know, an, an ongoing conversation within itself about, about what disciplines should be included, where the boundary lies. I think it's a very interesting question about what, what isn't in, included in, in that category. So thank you so much for giving us uh, your thoughts. They've been incredibly helpful and um, stimulating. Pleasure was all mine. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anna and Mike. Just one more pl plug in of a really important lesson for, I think, scholars of philosophy of science and history of science and social studies of science. I think what comes out uh, very much from this conversation is the difference between uh, the public and the private um, picture of science. It is often the case that you know, science as we see published in journals and science as we see it practiced in uh, seminars and, and in corridors in academy um, turns into a completely different beast when we see it on TV, when we see it in newspapers, when we see it on advisory bodies. And uh, um, w which is why, you know, if, if, you, if you're going to be serious about understanding um, um, science in its full complexity, you have to attend to both. And if I may add one thing, we're in many ways poorly prepared for this kind of role. So when I got my PhD in economics, we saw dynamic linear programming problems, you know, from Monday morning to Friday afternoon, but we never once talked about how to be a good expert in a professional setting in front of the public or whatnot. This is an area where we have some real space for professional improvement and we don't talk enough about that. Thank you. Well, this was a joy and uh, an exhilaration, um, and I hope we can do that again. See I'm you. sure we will. Thank you so much. Thank you, Erin. Thank, Thank you, Eric. Eric.